Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I am happy to be back with you today to further discuss artemisinin when it comes to glutamine uptake and utilization. I'm also going to cover another fatty acid that I think is important to cover when talking about the arena of ferroptosis, and that is palmitic acid. Remember, this is video number 64 and a long video series named Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. And if you're new to us, welcome, but you may be better served by starting towards the beginning of the series or starting with the video, How Metabolic Therapy Checkmates Cancer, to better understand where we may be at in this point in the series. So without further ado, let's get into it. So we essentially left off by talking about how dihydroartemisinin as well as artizunate, both interact with this SLC7A11 glutamate cysteine antiporter. And it doesn't necessarily block it directly, but by decreasing its expression, it downregulates the amount of SLC7A11, which is a critical transporter for the redox homeostasis for cancer cells. And we also talked about how dihydroartemisinin affects glutathione peroxidase and the iron pool that makes it more likely to interact with oxidants and participate in the Fenton reaction, which then downstream leads to ferroptosis and cell death of these cancer cells. But what we have not talked about is another transporter called SLC3A2. And it, I had to do some digging on this because it is not a common transporter that has been referred to in any prior video until today. So it says that it is an amino acid transporter that regulates the uptake of glutamine and leucine. SLC3A2 is also involved in the integrin signaling and involved in early activation of B and T cells. SLC3A2 is highly expressed in many malignant tumor types, such as breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and glioma. And further providing some additional background information about this transporter, this paper is titled targeting SLC1A5, now that is a transporter we've talked about in the past, and SLC3A2 slash SLC7A5 as a potential strategy to strengthen anti-tumor immunity and the tumor microenvironment. And it says here that in particular, the amino acid transporter SLC1A5 and SLC7A5, as well as the ancillary subunit SLC3A2, which are required for efficient uptake of glutamine, and leucine, respectively, could strengthen the metabolic capabilities and effector functions of tumor-directed CARNK and T cells. And what it's saying here is that this SLC3A2 is not the major portion of the transporter of this SLC7A5, which is this glutamine-leucine transporter, but is a it is one of the minor subunits which is required for this transporter to work. So that's why I wanted to give you the background about this transporter because this is something that we have not talked about in this series to this date. But when I was searching the literature for dihydroartemisinin and artemisinin in general and the mechanisms of how it affects glutamine transport and ferroptosis, this particular SLC3A2 came up and I had not been aware of it. So I wanted to bring it to your attention first as a background before we talked about its effect by artemisinin. So this paper is titled Dihydroartemisinin Triggers Ferroptosis and Primary Liver Cancer Cells by Promoting an Unfolded Protein Response Induced Upregulation of this CHAC1 Expression. And what it says here in this paper is that the results revealed that DHA-induced death of primary liver cancer cells was irrelevant of the P53 status. Now that's a concern that I've had several people in the comments say, well, I have P53 mutations. Will this be effective? In this case, for dihydroartemisinin and the way it kills these liver cancer cells, it is irrespective of the P53 status. And it says that primary liver cancer cells exposed to DHA, remember, this is not the omega-3 fatty acid, this is DHA dihydroartemisinin, displayed classic features of ferroptosis, such as increased lipid reactive oxygen species and maldonaldehyde levels, and iron overload and decreased activity of expression of glutathione. GSH, glutathione peroxidase 4, solute carrier SLC7A11, and SLC3 member 2. 
that is the SLC 3A2 we've been talking about just recently. And it says the anti-tumor effects of DHA in PLC cells were significantly weakened by two typical ferroptosis inhibitors, ferrostatin-1 and deferoxamine. So what is it saying? They were looking at these primary liver cancer cells and they were exposing them to this dihydroartemisinin or DHA. And it says that they were seeing classical effects of ferroptosis. And they were basically saying that they were seeing decreases in SLC7A11, that classic transporter we've been looking at, decreases in glutathione and glutathione peroxidase 4, as well as increases in lipid peroxidation and iron overload. And what they were doing was, in order to confirm that fact, is they were giving things that we know can block ferroptosis in cancer cells, and that would inhibit the effect. So definitely DHA is having a direct effect on all levels, really. Remember, there's several different pieces of this puzzle, and DHA, or dihydroartemisinin, is having an effect on several of those levels, including decreases in cysteine uptake, decreases in glutathione peroxidase, the decreases in construction of glutathione, as well as creating an iron overload within those cancer cells that makes them highly susceptible to participating in the Fenton reaction, causing lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis. Pretty cool. So the other thing I wanted to cover today in this session was palmitic acid. It's something that came up when looking at the paper we've been dissecting, talking about natural inhibitors of glutamine and glutathione production and induction of ferroptosis. And there has been a graphic that I have not shown so far, and that is how palmitic acid plays into this process as well that I want to, out of completeness sake, cover. So palmitic acid is a saturated fatty acid found in coconut and palm oil. It serves as an energy source for the body and plays a role in the structure and function of cell membranes. In recent years, palmitic acid has emerged as a promising anti-cancer agent with demonstrated efficacy against various malignancies, including gastric cancer, liver cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. Its anti-tumor effects encompass apoptosis in tumor cells, inhibiting tumor cell proliferation, suppressing metastasis and invasion, enhancing sensitivity to chemotherapy, and improving immune function. The main anti-cancer mechanism of palmitic acid involves the induction of cell apoptosis through the mitochondrial pathway facilitated by the promotion of intracellular reactive oxygen species generation. And the next paper I want to talk about is titled Palmitic Acid Induced Ferroptosis via CD36 Activates ER Stress to Break Calcium Iron Balance in Colon Cancer Cells. And it says here that subsequently, we verified that palmitic acid induces ferroptotic cell death through excess iron as cell death was inhibited by iron chelating DFP, deferoprone, while it was exacerbated by a supplement of ferric ammonium citrate. Mechanistically, PA, palmitic acid, affects intracellular iron content by inducing endoplasmic reticulum stress, leading to ER endoplasmic reticulum calcium release and regulating transferrin transport through increasing cytosolic calcium levels. So let's take a look at this graph real fast. So basically, palmitic acid is working to induce ER stress, which liberates calcium and starts to affect the induction of iron through transferrin trafficking, which leads to an increasing intracellular iron labile pool, which makes it more likely to be affected by oxidative stress, leading to lipid peroxidation and subsequently ferroptosis. Pretty cool. This leads to a question that I have received now several times in a row, and I still do not know the answer to this question yet, but I'm gonna make some inferences based off of this paper in particular. It said that this process of ferroptosis was exacerbated or made worse by a supplement of ferric ammonium citrate, basically giving supplemental iron in this particular supplemental form. And I've had several people say, should I give iron? Is this affected by an iron status? And the answer is I don't know yet, but that being said, I think it does make sense. The issue is that ferritin is what we call an acute phase reactant. And therefore, ferritin can be artificially high in an inflammatory conditions, such as cancer, such as infections, et cetera. So it's hard to know what your true iron status is of patients with cancer or chronic diseases. But that being said, if you are low in iron, there could be benefit by taking iron that would hopefully potentially allow this 
process of ferroptosis to be exacerbated or augmented. But I think that's still a to-be-determined piece of information, and I'm not making any recommendations or claims on this modality. It's something to talk about with your doctor, but it would be probably useful to have your ferritin levels checked to see if you are truly deficient, because if you're deficient in this process, it could make this process less likely to occur. However, overloading yourself with iron is probably not a good idea either. So therefore, I think it is about you know a balance, and that is to be looked at with you and your doctor looking at your serum ferritin levels and making an educated guess about whether or not this is a good intervention that could be employed by you and your doctor. That being said, I'm going to try to do some additional research to see if I can find any more definitive answers on whether or not supplementing iron can potentially help enhance ferroptosis for cancer. And really, this is the slide that made me want to do at least part of the video on palmitic acid because I kept seeing this, that palmitic acid was enhancing transferrin receptor uptake of iron, which then led to an increased labile iron pool and increased the ability for the ferroptotic cell reaction to occur through the Fenton reaction, lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis. So this is in the same paper that we've seen these kind of diagrams in, and I wanted to tie up that loose end because this is a diagram that I don't believe that I have actually had a chance to show yet to anyone, and I wanted to cover that in at least some detail that palmitic acid, again, a fatty acid found in palm oil and coconut oil could potentially enhance ferroptosis within this colorectal cancer model and likely would be synergistic with all the things that we know that can inhibit SLC7A11, glutathione peroxidase, et cetera, that could make this a synergistic approach to enhancing ferroptosis within cancer cells. I just want to say that it gives me great joy to do this research and to provide this information to you. If you like these videos, please like it. If you have people in your life that you know could benefit from this type of information, please share it with them. And until next time.